Good afternoon, Mr. How do you like it? Fair. Look at the shoulders. How do you like those lapels? Beautiful. Ah, but it'll look better on you, sir. No, always looks better on him. He's more relaxed. <laughs> Luther, a flower. Look at him. Nothing worries him. <laughs> I see you're not superstitious, Mr. Roman. Not in the least. That's very unfortunate. Why? Well, because Bataldi... What's the matter? <laughs> oh, nothing, nothing. Uh, well, if you want to know, uh, this suit has been cursed. Cursed? Yes. Uh, you remember Bataldi, our cutter? Yes, what about him? Well, I had to get rid of him on account of the suit. How come? I had an argument with him about these lapels. Oh, they're perfect. Uh, aren't they? When Bataldi left, he was red in the face with rage. And he asserted that this suit would bring misfortune to anybody who ever wore it. He cursed it. Well, it's too bad. Of course, Mr. Orman, this is the best suit that I have ever made. And I know it'll bring you good luck. Yes, sir, this is a lucky suit, Mr. Orman. And I guarantee your happiness in it. Anthony, I demand an answer. Is it true? Unfortunately, yes. No, no, no! Terrific, Paulus, terrific, a smash hit! We're over! Great Chief, they ate it up! The biggest opening night of the season, and you held them right on the palm of your hand every second, just like that! Paul, what's the matter? What's the matter? Where are you going? Chief, wait a minute. Chief, hurry, will you? They're waiting for you. You're out of pause. Come on, Paul, we're yelling for you. Where are you going? Are you mad? You've got to take 10 or 12 more curtain calls. No, that ain't possible. Where's Luther? Luther? Listen, you can't do this to me. What am I going to tell him? That you've gone crazy or something? I'll tell him I don't care if you step out of character. What character? Well, it goes. I am dead, remember? Oh, gee, please! Now, wait a minute. After all, I'm your manager, and I'd like to know. What's all this about? Go to my apartment and wait there. I'll call you up if I have any news for you. Step on it, Luther. Boss, you were really hot tonight. That last scene was a dilly. But I'm not interested. How long would it take now? Well, I think we can shave off ten minutes. We don't get stopped. Good. 
We'll be there in 15 minutes. Go on. Tell me what everybody says. Just what I told you. You were lucky to get rid of her last year. That's right. It was more than luck. It was a blessing. Why did I have three flops in a row? Because she thought she could act. The minute I come on that stage without her, look what happens. A smash hit. You said it, boss. But what beats me is why you want to start everything over again. Never mind. What are you slowing down for? Get going. Oh, Mr. Armand. How sweet of you. That's all right, Larry. I'm so glad you came. Paul. Good evening. You fool, why did you come? Love, it sometimes blinds me. After what I've been through today, he'll see you now and there's no telling what he'll do. Who? Your husband? Yes. How many times have I told you what I've been through this past year? My life isn't my own. He suspects us constantly. The mere mention of your name and he, he raves like a madman. Oh, what a pity. The current lunacy must be quite a strain on you. Pathetic. Paul, this is no time to joke. Please, you must go. Look, I've arranged everything perfectly for us. And now you're going to ruin it. Everything. Everything I've done. You are so completely bewildered that you haven't even asked me how the opening was. I opened it a plate tonight, if you remember. Oh, forgive me. How was it? A smash went like a house afire. And you? At my best. I'm so glad. Thank you. Please go, Paul. I'll be in town tomorrow at 10 o'clock to see you. Oh, you will? Certainly, as we planned. You little two-faced liar. Paul, you're mad. You'll see me tomorrow, eh? No, my dear. You will not see me tomorrow or ever again, as long as you live unless you buy a ticket at the box office. I'm saying goodbye forever. You came out here to say goodbye to me? No, I came out here to plead with you, to hold you, kiss you, fall at your feet. You've evidently changed your mind. Yes, when I heard you lie again. Do you know what it is to look into a woman's eyes when she's lying? Forgive me. I should be more tolerant with a liar. I have been one myself so often. We'll part without any further argument, quietly and calmly. I know everything. You're going with him tomorrow at nine on a plane to Canada to hunt moose. Oh, so that's the point. You did not tell him you were through with him as you said you were going to this afternoon. You did not tell him you loved me, no. Instead, you put your arms around your dear husband and said, yes, darling, I'll go with you anywhere. I am your good and loyal wife. I love only you, nobody else. <laughs> oh, please, you must go. John, look who dropped in. Hello, Mr. Ormond. Glad to see you. How are you, sir? I didn't know you were expecting the celebrated Mr. Ormond tonight. Oh, I didn't tell you, dear, but I was, really. In a way, I mean. Well, you see, Paul opened in a new show tonight. Oh, yes. So the new show is a flop, eh? <laughs> no, on the contrary, it was a magnificent success. I'm spending the weekend a few miles from here, so I just dropped in to wish you happy hunting. In Canada, isn't it? Yes. I do all my hunting in Canada. Oh, whoa there. Not so fast. Will you have a drink, Miss Dorman? No, thank you. Ethel? No. Don't you think you're having too many, dear? Frankly, no. And you're mixing your drinks, too. Please, John. That's the way I like my drinks, mixed. Keeps me interested in drinking. Otherwise, I get bored. Sure you won't have one? No, thanks. I have other remedies for boredom. I imagine. Well, I'm sorry I cannot stay for your party. 
so I'll say goodbye. And a very pleasant trip to both of you. Well, uh, you're wasting one of your goodbyes, Mr. Orman. My wife isn't going with me. She insists on staying behind. <laughs> <laughs> That's old Charlie Anderson. I must speak to him before he gets too tight. Well, goodbye. Goodbye. Go to the lodge at the end of the garden. Be careful. I'll be there immediately. I adore you. Forgive me for doubting you. Certainly. Do you love me? Oh, yes, of course I do. But, darling, we haven't much time. What do you mean, you have the rest of your life? But, Paul... Oh, come, please, sit down. You know, I learned something tonight. I learned how much I love you. You told me that a year ago. And you let me go. You let me marry him. You never even phoned. I know. If you'd asked me to forgive you. I was stupid. I didn't know then that love was anything more than a good scene, a charming scene. I didn't know it was something that that could tear at your heart and burn through the grease paint. You feel that way? I know what you've been doing. You've been telling me lies and telling him lies. I know. I've done it myself too often. But that is over for both of us. What do you mean? You're coming along with me tomorrow. Brazil. You can wire him. We'll stay there until he gives you a divorce. And then, then we'll get married. Married? You? Yes, me. I need you. I realize that today. I need you and I've got to pay for you. You frighten me. But you... you love me enough. Oh, yes, darling. I'll call you in the morning, right after he leaves. But if you love me so much, why were you so frightened in the house? He's very curious when he's drinking. I didn't want anything to happen to you. Why? I couldn't stand that. I couldn't live without you. I couldn't. Mary Hill, 7564, please. Who are you calling? Mr. Webb, my manager. Why him now? Got a little news for him. He's waiting at my apartment. What news, Paul? Kiss me. I told you. Madly, stupidly, blindly. Hello, Oliver? Yes, it's me. Never mind where I am. Pay attention, please, and no arguments. I want you to close the play. I said close the play. Yes, padlock the theater. I'm leaving tomorrow for six months. Poor, oh, close a hit. Darling, you're worth a thousand hits. I hope. <laughs> Oliver? No, no. I'm in my right mind. In fact, for the first time since I was born. Do what I tell you. But it's my show, my money, my theater. Close them. All right, pay everybody off. And get me two tickets to Rio on the Clipper for tomorrow. That's right. I'm a little amazed at myself. Did I sound very naive? No. Well, that's the way it goes. Always acting until you find something you can believe in. 
Put out the light. Party's becoming a bore. Too many drunks. I was looking for you. Uh, we were just talking over Paul's new play. It was so noisy in there. Yes, yeah, so I imagine. I wondered if you had changed your mind. About what? Canada. Coming with me. Oh, no. I'm afraid not, dear. Oh. <laughs> I don't see how you could resist it. Best shooting in the world if you're looking for moose. Have you ever hunted moose? Mr. Orman? No, I haven't. Maybe you'd like to come with me. John, you're drunk, please. Now, don't exaggerate. I never get drunk. I get involved, but not drunk. I'll let you use my favorite gun, Mr. Orman. Let me show you my collection. One of the best, you know. There it is. Took me years to gather this, and here. Here is my favorite. Never failed. Here he is, Colonel Johnson. Colonel Hoyer. Well, I, I was just going. Nonsense. Always wanted to talk to you. Don't mind if I spruce the Colonel up a bit, do you? Please don't point a gun in the house. Don't worry. The Colonel's not loaded. I may be a trifle, but not the Colonel. Three years ago, I got an elk. There he is. Last year, I shot over three moose. The colonel was only a captain then. I promoted him after the third moose. What did you want to talk to me about? Oh, a lot of things. But we begin with guns. They're my hobby. Oh, I don't think Paul is interested in guns. Oh, yes, guns have a certain interest. When in the hands of experts. Exactly. A man would be a nitwit not to be interested in a weapon like this. By George, a blind man could hit a duck's eye at a hundred paces with the colonel. <laughs> Good old colonel. You remember that fellow up there? <laughs> Ethel, you don't know where I put that oil can, do you? John, we've got to get back to the house. They'll be missing us. What? Our guests miss us? Not a chance. They're having a wonderful time. What did you want to say about guns, Mr. Holloway? Ever use them? Yes, on the stage. Shoot them? On the stage. Not real bullets? No. <laughs> Just blanks, eh? Yes, only blanks. We actors prefer them. Oh, this is silly, John. Paul's given an opening performance and he's probably exhausted. Darling, you haven't danced with me yet this evening. Come on, won't you? Uh, I noticed that. It's too late now. Oh, for heaven's sakes, would you stop puttering with that gun? I'm getting very angry. Why don't you go, Ethel? Perhaps your husband would prefer talking to me alone. Oh, no, no, no. I have no secrets for my wife. She may have for me. You know how women are. There's always half of them missing. But with men, they're usually in one piece, full of truth and honor. Yes, those things come with age. Thank you, that was well put. I suppose an actor can get along without much truth and honor. Oh, yes. An actor can get along without anything, except a good play. Sorry I missed your show. I understand you get killed in it. Yes, at the end of the last act. Couldn't make up their minds, eh? <laughs> no, it isn't that. They could not afford to kill me earlier. It would have been bad for the play. I see. I understand a woman shoots you. Yes. The woman I love. Sounds very dramatic. John! I don't want any interruptions. How do you act when she points the gun at you? Afraid? No. A little sad, but resigned. I'm drinking a highball. Have one. No, thanks. I can't bear to see you drunk like this. You promised me to... I'm not boring you, Mr. Holman. No, not at all. Just stand right up to her and don't act afraid, eh? Why is that? Don't sound real to me. Well, what would you suggest I do? A fellow always acts afraid when he's facing a gun. Oh, but an actor without courage would be a flop. The audience always likes courage. <laughs> So you think of your audience, are you, when you're acting? Always. That's something I could never understand about Ethel. I could never figure out whether she meant something and was just acting it. Kept me guessing for a year. Marriage is no fun when it turns into a guessing contest. All right. There you 
are, Colonel. All spruced up neat and clean and ready to go hunting. <laughs> You took, you took quite a long time about it, Mr. Holloway. I was getting very nervous. Excuse me. It was an accident. Was it? You saw it, Ethel. I was cleaning the gun. It went off. I didn't think it was loaded. You've killed him. What are you going to do? They'll come here. The police. They'll arrest you. They'll take you away. Oh, John, why did you do it? I can't bear it. This'll ruin you. Both of us. Why did you do it? It was an accident. I was cleaning my gun. You saw it. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. It's an accident. You can tell the police that it was unintentional. That your husband and I were the best of friends. Yes, of course. I'll tell them that. I'll say that. John, call a doctor, please. No. No. It's too late for a doctor. Curtain is coming down. It's the end of Act Three. A sad ending. No, no, we'll call a doctor. Oh, darling, I didn't know. I've been stupid and horrible. I made you do this. He did nothing. It was an accident. It might happen to anyone. Call the servants. You'll be my witness? Yes. To the end. Good girl. All right. I'll call them. <laughs> Don't bother. I'm all right. Paul, you, you're not hurt. Thank heaven. How do you like it, Mr. Holloway? Like what? My performance. Couldn't resist it. <laughs> you know, these scenes have been my specialty since I became famous. So when anybody shoots me, I fall dead. You were acting? Uh-huh. Oh, it's an off night for a colonel. He's not a wizard you made him out. Missed me by a mile. I hope you have better luck in Canada, Mr. Holloway. Oh, no. Don't feel so depressed. You know, I wouldn't look too good up there, on a plaque. You were acting? Yes. Your husband put it into my head, complaining about you, being unable to tell whether you meant anything or were only acting. I thought that would show him a sample of real acting. Paul, he didn't try to shoot you. It was accidental. The only thing accidental about it, my dear, is that he missed me. That was pure accident, not his. The colonels. I'm afraid, sir, you'll have to demote him. Make him a captain again. <laughs> oh, you shouldn't have worried about your wife, Mr. Holloway. Or she may become intoxicated with the wine of romance, but you, you will always be the morning after. You should have asked me about her. Then you would have been saved the embarrassment of trying to murder me. Paul, it's not true. I saw it. It was an accident. You must believe it. Yes. Yes, Mr. Holloway. She meant it, the things you doubted. She meant every word of them. She loves your strong, manly ways in your stalwart bank account. She loves you very devotedly, with her whole simple heart. God bless her. Goodbye, Ethel. 
You're not going to do anything about this. Not a thing. Armand, oh, I don't know what to say. Well, when you do, say it to her in the Canadian moonlight. Good night, Mr. Holloway. Good night, Captain. Good night. What's the matter? What's the matter? Why, well, you're bleeding. You've been shot. What's happened? Are you hurt bad, Mr. Armand? Who did it? Why, well, you're soaked. Listen, can you talk, Mr. Armand? Yes, yes, stop yelling. They shot you. Yeah. It's part of my new suit. Finest suit I ever had. It's my fault. I put it on the wrong dummy. I'll get a doctor. No, no. St. Luke's Hospital. Step on it. Remember, an accident. No publicity. I don't want you to spoil my scene. <laughs> I was superb. And that guy said this suit would bring you good luck. Uh, perhaps it has. Good morning, Edgar. Oh, it's you, Luther. Hello. Is it? Uh... Yes, yeah, all right to come in. Mr. Wilson's still asleep. Look out for broken glass. Well, what's happened around here? Mr. Wilson gets married tonight. Oh, of course, tonight. Was the bachelor dinner here? I guess it would have been. Mr. Wilson brought back some friends afterwards for a nightcap. <laughs> They seem to have had a little trouble getting one to fit. What's happened in the living room? The gentlemen were using it as a stadium. They thought it best to play several quarters of a Yale-Harvard game. <laughs> These were the goalposts. Oh, did one of them fall on you? The, oh, this? No, that occurred when the gentlemen decided to put me in in the last few minutes of play. A scrimmage? No, they gave me the ball, and I made the mistake of running the wrong way. Well, that's very dangerous. I know that now. Mr. Wilson personally tackled me. He was an All-American, you know. Oh, triple threat. Yeah, have a cigarette. Why are you taking that? Here to you. This is the very thing to wear to the wedding tonight. Mr. Wilson has his own tail coat. But I thought you might like to wear it yourself as a mark of respect for your employer. <laughs> Any respect I have for Mr. Wilson can be expressed by wearing shorts. But to tell you the truth, Edgar, I need ten dollars. Oh, yeah. I thought I could leave this hostage until I get paid Saturday. Oh, all right, let's have a look at it. This is uh, Mr. Ormond's coat, isn't it? Yes, it's Mr. Ormond's, but he doesn't need it in the hospital. What's the matter with him? Oh, something of a personal nature. Uh, mm -hmm. But isn't it a beautiful coat? Mm, yeah. Do they make all these coats with holes in them nowadays? Holes? Yeah. Must be a moth. Uh, pretty big moth, isn't it? Well, Mr. Armour always has the best of everything. <laughs> Including 32 caliber moths. Huh? Now, see here, Edgar. Either you loan me the $10 and keep the coat, or you don't. There's no need to quibble. I'm not quibbling. I haven't time to quibble. I haven't even got time not to quibble. Another interruption. Edgar, for the sake of our long friendship, and you're right, say, for the sake of our long-standing friendship. All right. But our long-standing friendship ends if you're not here on Saturday with those ten bucks. Thank you, Edgar. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, I, I said hello. Oh, good morning, Miss Diane. Uh, well, yes. Mr. Wilson is here. You don't have to go any farther, Edgar. I know that tone. It means Mr. Wilson is still asleep. <laughs> Stop yeah. mumbling. Just reach over and very firmly press the buzzer. Well, who cares about his head? Uh. Hello? 
all. Oh, hello, baby. How are you? Uh, and who are you? Only the girl you're going to marry. Now get up, darling. You have a luncheon date with me, remember? <laughs> I take it by that gargling sound you do. What time is it? It's 11.25, the day is Tuesday, the month is September, the lark's on the wing, and I've got a date to be married tonight. Yes, darling. Well, I'll see you in a little while. Goodbye. Sleep at this time of the day. Mark my words. A groom that sleeps means a bride that weeps. Well, that's a happy thought for my wedding day. Hello, Ellen. Hello. Oh, Diane. Marriage stinks. That's another happy thought. Oh, what's the matter, Ellen? Oh, everything. My handkerchief's soaking wet. Well, get one of mine, darling. Or maybe a towel would be more practical. <laughs> this is nothing to joke about. I'm miserable. I'm going to divorce Jim. He knows I've always hated women with red hair. <laughs> oh, there's a woman with red hair. Well, that's a relief from the usual mental cruelty. How do you know she has red hair? I found a comb stained with henna in the pocket of his tail coat. Oh. She doesn't even have real red hair. <laughs> and what were you doing in his tail coat pocket? What was I doing? Well, nothing. Did I... you fall in? Well, I happened to be looking for some stamps. The post office was too far away. Do they usually carry stamps in their tailcoat pockets? You'd be surprised at the things they keep there. Once when Jim went Darling, to... Darling, that sounds like a very long story, and I've got to get dressed. Why don't you come to Harry's with me? Oh, no, darling. I'm too gloomy to go anywhere. But, Ellen, this is my wedding day. I know. You be the something blue that brings good luck to the bride. Uh, tell Mr. Wilson you're here, Miss Diane. Oh, don't wake him all the way up, Edgar. I just want him to prop one lid open and look at me for a second. <laughs> He'll probably have double vision after he has this. What's that? Um, a health drink. <coughs> Judas! What's in it besides embalming fluid? Tabasco sauce, spirits of ammonia, red pepper, brandy, and, uh, a jigger of milk. I suppose it's the milk that packs the wallop. I'm sure it is, Miss Diane. Oh, Ellen, cheer up. How can I be cheerful when I know what I know about Jim? Well, in a way, it does serve you right. You shouldn't be looking in his pockets in the first place. I suppose you never look in Harry's pockets. Well, really, Ellen, the subject hasn't come up yet. And when it does, I assure well. you. Well. Well, what? The subject's come up, dear. What are you going to do about it? I'm not going to do anything about it. Because you trust Harry implicitly, I suppose. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd had this chance before I married Jim. Think of the time it would have saved me. Think of the time it might save you, if you look. Why, Ellen, that's a terrible thing to say about Harry. Listen, my blossom, you'd be looking this very minute if you weren't afraid I was right. And I don't think you're right. <sighs> you don't believe me? Uh-uh. All right, I'll show you. Stamps. Oh, what did I tell you? Well, I don't see why Harry can't keep stamps in his tailcoat if he wants to. There's no law against mailing letters after 9 o'clock. A hat check. Well, there's nothing very incriminating about that either. Lots of men take their hats off indoors. Handkerchief? Stop telling me what everything is. I know a handkerchief when I see one. Hold it up. Not even a trace of any lipstick. Keep on. Cigarettes? Matches? And 13 cents. You can see I'm marrying him for his money. Keep going. There's no place else to go. Oh, yes, there is. The most critical pocket of all. This is where I found the comb. Really, Ellen, this is getting to be... Look, what did I tell you? Oh, it's just a bill. Have they started putting perfume on bills? If they haven't, it's high time they start. Oh, no, you don't. If you won't, I will. My passionate lion. <laughs> you think I made it up? 
I couldn't make that one up. Well, let me see. You're right. My passionate line. Somebody ought to have a little talk with her about her spelling. They're using two S's in passionate these Never days. mind her spelling. Go on. All day long, I could feel you stalking me again. I could almost see your gleaming eyes and feel your hot breath on my neck. I could even hear the soft thud of your paws. Oh, the lion's got on rubber heels. Who's it from, Diane? Who's it from? It's signed Squirrel. So help me it's signed that way. Oh, you poor darling. Oh, my lion, mm. my lion. Every moment that you're away from me is eternity. Don't stand there like a jerk. Go out there and stop him. Stop, stop what? Stop them from reading that letter. Well, how? Any way you can, invent something, anything. Tell them the house is on fire. Hello, George. Drop everything and get over here right away. Everything's the matter. If you ever ran interference for me, you've got to run it now. Oh, my lion, I love your strength and your gentleness. I love the way you roar when... Excuse me, Mr. Ann, I think something's burning. I know, Edgar. It's me. Yeah, but... What? Well, go to the cleaners and get it. You're no good to me without a tailcoat. Pardon me, sir. I yeah. happen to have a tailcoat, sir. Here? Uh, yes, sir, in the kitchen. Edgar, you're a dream boy. Hello, George. Forget the tailcoat. Forget everything but speed. It's the fourth down. We've got a punt. Oh, my passionate lion. My ecstasy is almost unbearable. Thank you, thank you. The mink has just arrived. It is here on the bed beside me. Sleek and warm like... Baby, where are you? Good morning, darling. No, 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 no. Well, what? <laughs> Hello, Ellen. How are you? I'm in misery, and I think I've got company. Oh, no. Who could be miserable on a beautiful day like this? <laughs> well, isn't it a beautiful day? Great for stalking. Well, I think I'd better be going. Oh, no, Ellen, don't go. I know you two are dying to be alone. Oh, no, we're not. I mean, uh, uh, won't you stay for lunch? No, thank you, Harry. After all, this is your last lunch together. Before you're married, I mean. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. Bye. Goodbye, Harry, you beast. King of beasts. Hmm? <laughs> you would have to explain that to me. Matter lost in the darkness of the jungle. Jungle? Jungle bell, jungle bell, jungle all the way. Down. Maybe this can make things a little clearer for you, my passionate lion. Remember, this is his tail coat. Yes, but my tail coat is his tail coat. Correct. And his tail coat is my tail coat. Perfect. And, and his letter. It's my letter. And I don't understand any of it. Well? Well, 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 well where did... Oh, you where... know perfectly well where it came from. Your tail coat pocket. Oh, Diane, I, I don't... I oh, don't... Harry, stop not finishing sentences. Let's face it. Well, face what? The lion in his den. Anybody home? George! <laughs> Hello, George. How in the world are you? <laughs> and what brings you here this time of the day? Well, you'll have to answer that. Hello, Diane. Hello, George. Oh, am I interrupting anything? To coin a phrase, yes. Well, that's a fair answer. At least you're acknowledging that I'm in the room. That's more than she generally does, Harry. But you wait till I take that personality course. Well, goodbye, kids. Hey, George, don't go. Well, I'll be back later. Well, don't be an idiot. Don't even think of going. <laughs> what did you come for in the first place if you're going to go right away? Oh, it'll keep. Well, why keep anything now? Come on, George. <laughs> Tell us what it's all about. Well, it's just that after that football scrimmage last night, I put on the wrong tailcoat. You did what? I wore your tailcoat home by mistake and <laughs> came to get mine. <laughs> Best man's got to have his own tailcoat, you know. Oh, look, there it is there. Now, you see? George, say that again. <laughs> I wore Harry's tailcoat home by mistake. You mean, you mean, uh, uh, this is your tailcoat? Yeah, it looks like it to me. Yeah, it is. Certainly, that's right. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> My cigarettes and matches. 
George. My handkerchief. Hatchet. George. Are you sure this is your tailcoat? I know my own tailcoat when I see it. Well, you didn't know it last night. Well, uh, I wasn't exactly sharp as a rowboat last night. Besides, Harry and I are about the same size. Exactly, we're exactly the same size. <laughs> Why, yes, you are, aren't you? Huh. And the same build, too. Except I think that George's shoulders are just a tiny bit broader. <laughs> Harry, why don't you run on and put your pants on, please? That's not a bad idea. A shave wouldn't hurt, either. No, it certainly wouldn't. A nice, clean shave, like George has. Well, go on, go on. All right, I will. Uh, uh, keep Diane company for me, will you, George? Sure. <laughs> a boy. That's the best friend a man ever had, Diane. Do anything for you. I'll see you soon. <laughs> that for? Just thought it might make you feel a little more at home. Hmm. Seems to have the opposite effect. What are you looking at me like that for? Haven't you ever seen me before? No, I don't think I have. At least not in this particular life. behind that table for? Well, this is the first time I've ever been alone with a lion. Lion? Me? Well, that's what the squirrel calls you, isn't it? Squirrel? You know. Don't tell me you've forgotten her already. Oh, squirrel. <laughs> yes, of course. Little squirrel. George, I'm surprised at you. I'm kind of surprised myself. You're certainly different from what I thought you were like. Oh, I didn't think you thought I was like anything. Yes, I did. I thought you were dim. Yes, that's the word, dim. I thought you stayed home nights and solved chess problems, you know, mate and three and all that sort of thing. But now... But now you don't think I'm dim? I don't think you're dim. And there isn't any chess. And you certainly haven't any problems. Oh, yes, I have. Well, lions don't have problems. Lions are free and uninhibited. I can see you now. As evening falls, moving silently through the jungle. On your soft paws. You do? Shh. Your eyes are gleaming. Your mane is shaking as you go stealthily along. Finally, you get there. Where? Stop interrupting. You get there. I can see you at the door. No, I can't see you at the door. Do you knock or do you ring the bell? Just smash the door down. Oh. But doesn't it hurt? Oh, I broke my shoulder once, but it was only a scratch. Tell me, George. What do you two talk about? We just chat about current events. Don't you roar? Like she says you do? Oh, that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, naturally, a lion roars. George, will you roar now? No, I'm not in the mood. Oh, George, come on, please, just for me. Oh, I'd feel silly. Oh, George, please. Oh. Wow. That's not a lion. It's a Pekingese. Oh. Wow! Oh. Oh. You're scared now, huh? Oh, I'm not scared. Don't be silly. I mean, I mean, this is just... Oh, now, wait. Just a minute. Lions can be tamed, too. Mm. Forget. 
Go on back. Back. Come on back. 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 Come on back, back, back. Back. Down. Down. There. That's a good line. Oh, we lions have our gentle moments. Mm -hmm. And the lion shall lie down with the lamb and all that? Mm -mm. No? Mm -mm. The lion shall lie down with the squirrel and all that. Oh. That's the way it goes, isn't it? And the squirrel shall lie down with the mink. <laughs> kind of a Noah's Ark arrangement, isn't it? Oh, Noah was late in the run. This goes all the way back to Adam. Were there squirrels in the Garden of Eden? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's probably why Eve left. That's a pretty cynical thing for a young woman to say. And what would you like me to say? Oh, my lion, my lion, every moment away from you seems like an eternity. Is that better? Swell. Well, you ought to like it. She wrote it to you. Oh. Tell me about it, George. What's she like? Well, she's... She's... She's lovely. You know, sitting there like that, you look a lot like her. I do? Yes, yeah, same long lashes, same little nose, same sunlit hair, same laughing eyes. But I don't write letters. I wish I did. It must be fun to write things like strange how you're giving me thoughts I've never had before. How being near you is not like being near anyone else. That's the best part of the letter. How knowing you is different from knowing anyone else in the whole world. Is that right, George? It's perfect. I'm glad you like it. Would you like to hear what I wrote her? Yes, I'd love to. Your voice is like a sunrise. Like a garden in bloom. Like a bird against the sky. Do more, George. Why don't you be kind and set me free? Or why don't you be kinder and hold me forever and ever? You don't mind my quoting that, do you? Oh, no, of course not. It's wonderful. <laughs> you seem to have caught each other's mood. Exactly. Yes. You know, people do that sometimes. In letters, I mean. Brush your lips across my cheek, my dear. Is that from the letter? Oh, no. Out of my head, I just wanted to hear what it would sound like. It sounded wonderful. Let's see what this sounds like. I want more than anything in the world to hold you in my arms. Letter? No, head. There was darkness for a long, long time. And suddenly the light came, and the light was you. Letter. Head. Darling. Now and from the beginning. Head, Diane. These moments we have are ours forever. Letter. These moments we have. Head. Heart. George. How do people know when they're really in love? Well, first, I guess they find out they like to be together, and then they find out they kind of think the same things, and then I guess after a while they get so they even say the same things at the same time. And that's the way you know? Well, I'm just guessing. Well, your guess would be my guess, too. 
It must, must be, be wonderful, wonderful when, when it happened. Like, like that. that. George. I've waited a long time. But now? Now, you're going to marry Harry. And according to custom, the best man kissed the bride. That's all there is to it. He isn't here. Uh, this is an empty apartment. There's nobody here. Nobody, in in including me. That's all right, Edgar. I'll wait. Oh, he won't be here at all. He's, Miss Gray, he's gone to Chicago I, uh, for the night. I see. Yeah. He's in Chicago, and the wedding's in New York. Why are my letters scattered all over the place? To make the room look lived in? She follows me everywhere. I'll show him he can't treat me this way. She hates flowers. And fruit, too. Oh, George, stop her. She doesn't like champagne, either. Squirrel! Oh. <laughs> Squirrel. Um, she has a very bad memory. So I see. What the? I'll show you what the getting married without telling me. Should I throw a pizza? Look, I can explain the whole thing, Diane. You see. Never mind, George. I guess it's up to me now. I'm sorry, Diane, but I kind of put George on the spot. You see, his tailcoat really isn't my tailcoat. It's his tailcoat. No, it's not and really I... my tailcoat. It's Edgar's it's tailcoat. It's not really my tailcoat. It's Luther's tailcoat. No, no, it's not, not Luther's tailcoat. It's Mr. Allman's tailcoat, and he's in the hospital. You see, my tailcoat no, really... Just a minute. I really... think it's better if nobody explains anything to anybody. Here's your letter, squirrel. And here's your ring. Harry. And here's my line. You, you, uh, you ever want me to help you out again, Harry? Just let me know. <laughs> Got a hole in it. We know it's got a hole in it. Question is, how much? With the hole. Seven dollars. Seven dollars? For that coat? Come on, Edgar. Nah. Just, uh, just a second. Let me take it over to the light. Find anything you like? Oh, thank you, yes. Just look. Seven dollars, and you said at least twenty-five. I said we'd split all over ten, didn't I? Over ten, yes. That's why you're here, to watch what I get for it. Well, here you are. Ten dollars, take it or leave it. We'll take it. I'll take it. Come on, Luther. Uh, good day, gentlemen. My, what a fine coat. It would be so nice for my husband. Uh, why, is your husband a waiter? Oh, no, he's not a waiter. He's a great musician.
cannot conduct sleepwalkers. I cannot raise the dead. I cannot. I will not. Back to 26, gentlemen. Your E flat is flat, mister. Will you oblige me by not rewriting the score? That note is sharp. Yes, yes, you play everything as it is written, every note, like robots, without life, without feeling. But they are not just notes, they are notes written from the brain, from the heart. Music without feeling is noise. Don't you understand? What do you see? Triplets. Yes. Shame. Triplets. All right, gentlemen, this is too much. We'll proceed in half an hour. You need the rest. So do I. It's too late to apologize. What is it? Excuse me, Maestro, but uh, Smith is here. What Smith? Charles Smith, the composer, the man I told you about. When? For the last ten years. You promised to see him tomorrow. Well, this is not tomorrow. But that was yesterday. That's when you told me tomorrow, and that is today. Sorry, no time. But, uh, Maestro, the man is a genius, a, a master. Oh, no, Maestro. I've always thought of Stravinsky as the most, uh, no. Worthy of your distinguished consideration. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Well, what are you waiting for? Play? Yeah.
When is he going to play it? I'm going to conduct it myself. <gasps> Darling, we rehearse for two weeks, starting tomorrow. The scherzo flawed. It floored me, though, too, darling. He came right over to me, carrying his eyes shining. And Smith, he said, Smith, he said, you're a genius. And you know he's going to present me to the public himself. Ladies and gentlemen, I have great honor to present Mr. Smith. The Carnegie Hall. Oh, no. Charlie, you can't conduct the symphony in that. Tears and white tie. But he hasn't got a tailcoat. You should have thought of that before. I should have thought of it. I, I've got nearly crazy thinking of everything and now... Why, Cookie, darling, I can get you a tailcoat. I know just where. Now, you, you two run along and I'll bring everything along to the dressing room. You should be all right, darling. Oh, hurry, please. It, it's very important. All right, madam. Now, uh, what size is your husband? Oh, I don't know. Oh, here, here he is. <laughs> oh, that's right. Your husband's a musician, isn't he? Yes. Mm -hmm. I see. Now. There you are. That'll fit like a glove. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Charles Smith. Ha, 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 ha! 
One. Continue, please. I bet you know somebody who's down in their luck. Indeed I do. Give him that, will you? Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, it's a tailcoat. No, no, no. That's a rabbit's foot. Good night. Bless you. Come along, come along, come along. Grandma, come on. Does this look like a rabbit's foot to you? Hmm? Rabbit's foot? <laughs> Looks more like the rear end of a million dollars. <laughs> Better put it in the cupboard, Molly, there. There's the key. Oh, shut up. Please. Hello, folks. Molly, if those are bells, you can keep right on going. I've got to deliver them, but you don't have to open them. <laughs> Any mail for me, Dad? No Valentines. Will you shut up? Molly, what do you make of this? Goodbye. Huh? Oh, goodbye. Come again. Avery L. Brown. Avery L. You don't suppose that could be Larry? Blackstone Hotel, Chicago. Might be at that. He showed up last night. No, probably up to his old tricks. Fancy way to spell Brown with an E. Yes. I, I, th I think I'd better... I think I'd better go and see. Don't forget to lock up. Oh, no.
yours. Your stomach gets to gnawing, drop around. Yeah. Really. What are you standing there for? Go on, read it. That's what you brought it here for, isn't it? Class of 1917, University. 25th anniversary dinner at the Waldorf Astoria. Eight o'clock, October 5th. Why, well, that's today. Urge you in the name of the love we all bear our alma mater to be with us. H.B. Hank Bronson. Hank. Formal dress. I figure this put me on my feet again. Sure, sure. Go right ahead. <coughs> Got a cigarette? No. Here, have one of mine. Go ahead. Oh. Thank you. You've been around here about five years now, Larry. Six. And every day for six years, you've been talking about going uptown, getting on your feet again, away from all this. But you always seem to need one more drink to get your nerve up. Maybe if you didn't get it up someday, you might really go. You know, I, I know what I'm doing. Oh, sure you do. Sure. I don't want anybody preaching at me. Did I ever tell you not to take it? If you feel the need of another drink, why don't you have one? I'll buy. Well, oh, here. Larry, they tell me they got a mighty good cook at the Waldorf. Why don't you go? Ought to be a nice party. Here's your chance to get uptown again. And I don't mean north of 14th Street. I mean north of yourself. Oh, Larry, you've seen enough of gutters and flop houses and handouts. Maybe if you got your feet under a table again for a spell, ordered a good thick steak, slept in a clean bed, Talk to your own language? Well, you might be right in there punching again. What do you say? What is it, a costume party? You want me to go as uh, J.P. Morgan? I want you to go as Avery L. Brown. Avery L. Brown with an E. Hmm. Are you worried about your looks? That's in Molly's department. And by the way, we just got a dress code in this morning. Probably sent right from heaven. Will you shut up? Really ought to have patent leathers, but I think those britches are long enough. I don't believe anybody will notice. 
I still say you should have got him a regular shirt. You know what they cost? A dollar seventy-five. I don't care. Suppose that ridiculous, uh, what you call it, uh... Dickie, mother. Well, suppose it pops out. Oh, won't if he keeps his vest button. They call them waistcoats up where Larry's going, Mary. There, Larry. Put that on now. A nice piece of goods, mother. Yes, it must have cost a pretty penny. Feel that silk. Mmm. Your waistcoat, Mr. Brown. There. That ought to hold a man of your size. If you don't eat too much. Why, you'd think it was made for you. Almost. Come on, Larry. Let me see it. Oh, that's fine. Give him the hat, Larry. Put it on. All right. Perfect. Oh, uh, here, Larry. Hmm. Here's what was left in the box. It's enough for a couple of drinks. Or it'll take you uptown. Good night. Good night, Mr. Brown. kiss you. <laughs> Say, you've lost a little weight, haven't you? Yes, well, I, I didn't realize it myself until I got into this coat tonight. <laughs> What's the trouble? Haven't they been feeding you right? Oh, no, just hard work, my boy, just hard work. You ought to try it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Larry. Hello, Larry. Hello, Larry. How are you? Hey, waiter! Oh, How's about a little something for Brother Brown to wet his whistle with? He's way behind. Brother Brown, don't you? Well, what Larry, up, Pete, pal? You? Some of Mrs. Waldorf champagne, or would you rather have something with hair in his chest? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but I never touch it. Uh, I always serve it, but uh, I never touch it myself. Okay, pal. But do me a favor, will you? Just hold it. Now, don't force yourself. Just hold it. <laughs> Whoa, don't, don't waste it. That's, that's precious stuff. We, we got to conserve it. <laughs> well, if you don't drink, you can still eat. Waiter, another plate. Uh, no, thank you, but I, I, I just ate on the plate. Yeah, what plane? Well, I uh, just flew in from the coast. Say, wait a minute. Don't tell me you've been in California all this time and didn't look me up. No, I just passed through. Uh, I, uh, I've been in China. China? Mm -hmm. Say, that must have been interesting. You see anything of the fighting? Oh, a little. Oh, whereabouts in China? All over, from chop suey to chow mein. <laughs> <laughs> Same old Larry. Oh, boy, am I glad to see you. Larry, yes. Larry, come here. I want to have a talk. Uh, oh, Larry. Larry. Oh, oh, never mind, we'll be right back. Uh, listen, going to be in town long? Well, uh, just a few days till I see how the land lies. Haven't got yourself tied up yet, have you? Well, no, not exactly, well, but... Don't, uh, don't. I've got a job that's right down your alley. Well, I never turned down a client yet. Tax matter. Well, just my meat. I know. Can you be at my office tomorrow at 9.30? Well, I plan I on, want uh, you to meet my partner, McReynolds. Get an idea of the whole setup. Yes, but uh, you oh, see... Oh, uh, a question of money. We'll take care of that. Where are you? 40 Wall Street. Well, I'll be there. Good. Well, Larry, I see you're still late to classes. Professor Lyons. Yes? This above all, 
to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not be false. Not then be false. Not then. Are you still trying to rewrite Mr. Shakespeare? I'll not then be false to any man. Right. <laughs> How are you, my boy? Fine, sir. You? I'm always fine. Comes of having a cast iron stomach and no ambition. <laughs> oh, yes. I just go on vegetating year after year, like the ivy on the old chapel. You remember it? While you prosperous lawyers and doctors and big-time financiers leap from one triumph to the other, getting rich and fat. <laughs> fat, anyhow. Well, you know, sometimes I confess I envy you boys. Then again, I don't know. It's rather fun to sit with the other stick in the muds and watch the parade go by. See you boys beat the drums and blow the big bassoons while we take all the credit. <laughs> it's been 25 years now, Professor. Here we are again. Yes, must seem like a long time to you boys. Yes, I remember we were going to lick the world. Yeah, save it for democracy. Show the older generation what we could really do with the mess they made of things. Lord, we were young and full of vinegar. Remember, Professor? Yes, yeah, I was thinking of that today when I was looking at my class in English 1. They're kids, just like you were. Mm, a little brighter, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> then I thought, well, they haven't changed the old world very much. Come right down to it, they haven't done so badly either. Tom, you've made a pretty good judge, everything being equal. Thank you. John, they tell me you've cut out a lot of appendices in your time and been overpaid for it, too. <laughs> Larry here has been in China. Now, that's quite an achievement in itself. Father's sigh ever got was Puget Sound one summer. That must have been, oh, 40 years ago. I've lived on the memory of it ever since. Yes, you have your families, you're doing your jobs, and you haven't forgotten your friends. When you get as old as I am, you'll discover that those are the things that really spell success and happiness. Ding -a -ling -a -ling -ling. Hey, Prof, didn't you hear the bell ring? That means class is over. You know, we got some serious singing and drinking to do here. Well, don't let me stop you, Henry. I never could. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, fellas, now get, now get ready. Larry, oh, oh, Hen, Hen, my boy, how about giving Larry one of your nice little old Corona Coronas before we start? You know, the guy must have some vices. <laughs> I'm sorry, Larry, I just had to order some more. Hank here took the last handful I had. Well, you, <laughs> well, you gotta have something these days to sell insurance with. <laughs> Besides personality. <laughs> Hello, Brown. Hello, Williams. Did I hear somebody say you've been out in China? That's right. Long? Oh, uh, quite a while. Where have you been? Oh, same old stamping grounds, Chicago. <laughs> Can I put it on the bill, sir? No, no, this is my treat. There you are, boys. Help yourself. <laughs> The champion fumbler. Let yeah, me let get me it. Get it. Oh, no, 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 this is on me, this is on me. Oh, let me, let It's a me. funny thing, I'm sure I had it when I came in here. Boy, what'd you do, lose your, lose your wallet? Yeah. Hey, lock the door, somebody. Don't anybody leave this room. A crime's been committed. What'd you have in it, any good addresses? <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I had considerable money in it. I was planning to run down to Washington tomorrow, and I had a check cash just before I left the office. Yeah, well, don't worry now. We'll get to the bottom of this. I don't listen to Fred Allen's mighty art players for nothing. Me, one long pan detective, too. <laughs> now, keep your places, everybody. We've got to reconstruct the crime. Who is standing next to you, Anderson? Oh, Larry there, I believe. Larry? Oh, Brown, eh? Split with me, kid, and I'll get you out of it. Hey, wait a minute. You were standing next to Henderson, too. <laughs> That's right. But you sat next to him at dinner. Sure. Well, gentlemen, there's only one thing to do. Search everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Detective. I don't think that'll be necessary. <laughs> Why not? I think it's an excellent idea, even though it is all in fun. Don't you, Brown? In fact, I insist on being searched. <laughs> Anything to get out of this monkey suit. I haven't had this on since I was married. Do we have to take off our pants, too? <laughs> well, what's the matter, Brown? Where's your sense of humor? Yeah, come on, Larry. Come on, let's step out of it. Take your hands off me. Oh, so you're gonna get tough, eh? Well, here's where I've got to tackle the best little old tackle for his weight we ever had. Now, cut it out. Get away from me. 
Hey, come on, fellas, let's get it off. Take it easy. Uh, just a moment. This is still a free country. You can't force a man to testify against himself. That right, Judge? <laughs> well, not in my court. Court? There's an idea. We'll hold court, and we'll have the jury. We'll put it up to the jury to decide. Now, you guys over there, you'll be the jury. Uh, Twelve good men and true. Sit down, gentlemen. Gentlemen of the jury, take your places. I'm going to sit right here. <laughs> hey, Williams, you're a big-shot ambulance chaser. How's it about being DA? Oh, I should be delighted. Unless Brown would prefer to use me as a character witness. Judge, Your Honor, looks like you're in session. All right. What'll it be worth for me to defend you? No, I think the joke has gone far enough. What do you say we get back to our singing, huh? But the prisoner can easily put a stop to it by merely permitting himself to be searched. Hey, fellas, clear, clear the witness box. Hey, hey. Clear the witness box. Gentlemen, I declare this court to be in session. You will now proceed, Mr. Prosecutor. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, in view of the circumstantial nature of the evidence in this case, the state will be compelled to call into question the character of the prisoner at the bar, and will endeavor to prove by the testimony of eyewitnesses that the culprit, by his past conduct, has placed himself beyond the pale of decent society. What is on the level? Order, order in the court. Sit down, everybody, or I'll have you thrown out. Your witness, Mr. Brown. It's, uh, it's quite all right, Your Honor. My lend colleague and I were just giving you a little idea of how we used to conduct our cases out in Chicago. Hey, Williams? <laughs> Gentlemen of the jury. You don't know what it means to me to be here tonight with my old friends of the class of 1917. I don't mind telling you, I've thought of you many times. Oh, boy, I sure wish I'd known that. I got a little policy that's just made to order for you. <laughs> <laughs> However, that's beside the point. What you're interested in is to hear my answer to this charge that's been brought against me. And frankly, I wish I'd come prepared to make a better defense. But uh, believe it or not, Speech-making was the last thing in my mind tonight. What I really came for was to, uh, well, you might say I was chasing a will-o'-the-wisp. For a while there, I thought perhaps I'd found it. Especially when I was talking to my old roommate, Soupy Davis, and uh, Professor Lyons. And I expect I didn't. You want to know why? Because you're too sober. <laughs> like me. <laughs> my defense such as it is, begins on the day we graduated, day in June, 1917. It leads first to an army training camp, then overseas, the armistice, home against Chicago, the law. Nothing very unusual about that. Nor I'm afraid about the next chapter in the life of one who, as you'll recall, just barely knows Williams out as the man you voted most likely to succeed. A girl, marriage, a home, and a succession of threadbare clients who always seem to be guilty, but who never seem to have the foresight to steal enough to disprove it. <laughs> My wife. Uh, you, you, you remember her, Williams? I ought to. I introduced her to you at the senior prom. Probably one of the few mistakes you ever made. A beautiful woman. <laughs> Magnificent woman. Who had every reason to expect all the things she might have had if she'd married someone else. Oh, so that's what started you picking pockets, huh? Shushi la femme. <laughs> the jury will disregard that remark, and I find you one highball. <laughs> <laughs> and then a wonderful and beautiful thing happened. Prohibition. <laughs> that noble experiment of blessed memory came to dwell among us. And nowhere, I assure you, was a greeter with such open arms as in Chicago. <laughs> Almost overnight, business began to pick up. My clients, sir. Uh, you referred one of the first to me, Your Honor. Thank you. My clients, while no less likely candidates for the jug than formerly, <laughs> were sufficiently well healed by now to be regarded as the very pillars of our community. Fortunately for me, they were both generous and grateful. 
And I confess that for a little while I saw myself getting stinking rich. <laughs> but the catch is, Your Honor, it didn't last. What does, Larry? Oh, I don't know. A good many things. Friendship. A good fellowship. Isn't that why we're here tonight? All the things Professor Lyons was talking about? You, uh, uh, you believe that, don't you, Williams? Mm, with all my heart. But as I was saying, with the advent of prohibition, too many of my clients began to fill untimely graves. <laughs> while uh, more and more of the others began to display a prison pallor. <laughs> well, if it hadn't been for a pretty fancy tightrope performance, I might not have been here myself tonight. There's no doubt about that. Yes, as it turned out, it was a simple case of this bomb, and hardly worth a mention, not even in the Chicago Tribune. You must admit you got the benefit of every doubt. Oh, yes. Thanks to you, the Grievance Committee of the Bar Association was very generous. We wanted to spare your wife and family. And unfortunately, my wife didn't see the full humor of my uh, predicament. A loss of ideals, Professor Lyons would call it. And on the advice of counsel, quite uh, rightly decided that it had all been a ghastly mistake about which the less said the better. After all, who was to blame her? She was still young, beautiful. <laughs> I realized I had been fortunate to have known her at all. As for me, well, there was really nothing left to hold me. So I just drifted around. First one place, then another until finally I had the very good fortune to settle down in China. Chinatown. Larry. <laughs> Put one over on you, didn't I, about coming in on a plane tonight? Had you going too, Soupy, about taking that tax job? Oh, well, why not? The whole thing's a joke. I mean, my being here at all. As a matter of fact, I hadn't given it a thought until this morning when a friend of mine uh, Nice fellow. Runs a mission down on Doyle Street. You ought to drop around, hold services with us sometime, all of you. Here's some real testimonies. You made me a little bet that I couldn't come up here tonight and pull the wool over your eyes. <laughs> By George, I'd have taken his money, too, if Henderson here hadn't been so careless with his pocketbook. Or if Hank hadn't suggested our being searched. Yes, sir, I'd have walked out of this room tonight, Avery L. Brown, class of 1917. The best tackle for his weight the old school ever had. And not one of you would have been the wiser. Except Williams, of course, and he never would have let an old classmate down, would you, Williams? Sorry, Judge, but I'm afraid I haven't got any defense after all. I'm just the kind of guy who would steal Henderson's pocketbook. So I plead guilty. Of course, you haven't anything against me for circumstantial evidence, but... <laughs> I know too much about the law to think I could get a client with my record off that easily. Yes, sir. Looks as if my only chance is to follow William's advice. Take off my coat, let you search me, and throw myself on the mercy of the court. your wallet in the car, sir. I thought perhaps you might need it. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. Will you shut up, please?
Larry, how was it? Did you have a good time? Must have been some party to keep you out till morning. The well, party's over. Here's your J.P. Morgan outfit. Larry! Yeah, Mother. Here's your rabbit's foot. Take it across the street to Santelli Brothers. Maybe you can get enough on it to buy a rabbit stew. Excuse me, does Larry Brown live here? Yes. Won't you come in? My name's Bronson, Hank Bronson. How do you do, Mr. Bronson? This is Judge Barnes. Right. How do you do? And Mr. Davis. How do you do? Larry had an engagement with me for 9.30 this morning. Thought I'd drop by and pick him up. Yes, we didn't want him to be late the first day on the job. Job? Sure. He's going to work for me now. Well, uh, uh, I, you boys had such a party last night, I, I, I suppose he's due to oversleep a little. <laughs> yeah. Well, could we... Uh... Oh, oh, don't worry. I'll have him there on time. All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you. And uh, don't forget to tell him we were here. Yeah, he knows the address. Oh, yes, 40 Wall. Thank Goodbye. You. Goodbye. Goodbye. What am I going to do with this now? Why, take it over to Santelli Brothers, just like I told you. It's done its job here. Now maybe it'll help somebody else. Oh, yes. Yeah. job myself you stick in a car i slip in behind you when they open the door why don't you shut up you know you gotta have a suit of monkey tails to get in this joint strictly a park avenue layout come on hurry up Take it easy, we got till 10 o'clock. We get a hot car. The guy will find out it's been snatched and starts walking. Oh, shut up. Oh, uh, I'm a friend of Mr. Reed Patton's. Good evening, Mr. Reed. Good evening. Good play tonight? Yes, sir. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Stick them up. <laughs> Not a bad take, about 50 G's. Pike out joint. What about the plane? Let's wait and slip the pile of two grand and no questions asked. You'll be in Mexico City tomorrow. All right, meet me there next week. Ditch the car, not too close to the airport.
Where'd that come from? Heaven. <laughs> Shut your mouth. Can't you see the lightning done put the mark of the Lord on this thing? <laughs> I ain't asking where it come from or why. <laughs> but it sure come at the right time, the day before Christmas. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I've been praying for that brindle cow ever since I've been married. Glory. Praise the Lord. The Lord's done been here and gone. I'm gonna buy me a tractor, one of them red ones, with a brand new engine a humming and a shining in the sun. <laughs> I'm gonna buy me two tractors, three tractors, and a big piece of bottom land and seeds and a great big house. Wait, Lou. You gotta pray for things like that, and you ain't never prayed for nothing in your life, and you knows it. No, Esther, I wish for plenty, except maybe I didn't bend my knees. Wishing ain't praying. It ain't iron to keep. It's sinful to have so much money. But Reverend Lazarus, he's the man of God on this place, and he ought to know what the Lord's got on his mind. Let's take all that money to him so he can tell us what to do. Listen, Esther, if you prayed for a tractor, ain't it understood you'd be praying for the land that goes with it? Get gone, Lou. Sinning against the Lord and the law. Look mighty like sin from up here. Does the sheriff know about this? This ain't no sin, Reverend Lazarus. There's too much goodness in it. <laughs> Have you been drinking? Esther say the Lord sent this miracle from heaven itself, riding on the wind of the lightning. You know, I ain't the one to argue with her. That sure is a powerful miracle you got down there. I've heard a heap of praying in my day. I ain't never seen the Lord pass no miracle before. That's blaspheming, Reverend. Shut your mouth, Nicodemus. Who's the preacher around here? Or is you? I ain't saying the Lord didn't pass this here miracle. <laughs> hey, Jim! You certain this coat come from up there and not from down there? Smell more like the devil than the Lord. I reckon Moses didn't stop to figure how the devil sent the manna to the children of Israel out in the wilderness. He knew the Lord sent it because he believed in the Lord. That's what this is. Manna from heaven. Lord done gone and done it again. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Here's a miracle, ain't it? Well, I gotta put it away until I get this thing figured out. Oh, wait a minute, Reverend. I already got it figured out. It's the answer to all them that's prayed, added up to the last penny. Well, hallelujah. I prayed for a horse and buggy, and last night when the storm blew, I prayed for a new roof. I reckon I prayed about a hundred dollars worth. Watch out. Don't forget, Rev, the Lord is counting right along with you, too. You mean right here in this room? I reckon I just wished for that horse and buggy and didn't get around to praying for it. This is the most upsettingest miracle I ever heard of. And the Lord done sent this as a Christmas present to all the folks in this here place. Everybody caught to what they prayed for. I'll sure welcome that tractor. And what you pray for and believes in, you get. Matthew 21, 22. Blessed am the poor, but well, that's all they get. Hey, Reverend, don't that say blessed am the poor in spirit? That all comes to the same thing. When you're poor, you're poor all over. <laughs> that sure me, all over. Our prayers is done for us. You're right, Sister Esther. Christmas presents, that's what it is. Everybody according to his friend. And we's the deputies of the Lord. <laughs> Ain't that something? Hallelujah. Uh, what'd you pray for, Sister Esther? Oh, I prayed for that brindle cow. Well, the uh, Lord's allowing you about $60 for that. Thank you, Lord. Uh, what'd you pray for, Brother Luke? I want a tractor, a red one. And I want it so mighty bad, I knows the Lord ain't gonna let no prayers stand between us. 
you gets the tractor, Luke. Maybe Luke ain't the praying kind official like, but the Lord knows there's a lot of goodness in him. I agree. I've been wishing for a tractor my... I said wishing, not praying, sister. sister. Uh, I looked it up in the catalog, and the price I'm revealed is $798. Here you are, Luke. I prayed for a slingshot, Reverend. That's a weapon of the devil. If he prayed for it, he gets it. Well... Here's one dollar for a slingshot, and may the Lord guide your hand. I pray for a, I pray for a new pair of shoes. Here's two dollars for shoes, and Merry Christmas. I pray for a blanket with no holes in it. Here's three dollars for a blanket for Christmas. I pray for shoes with stockings. Here's four dollars for the shoes and stockings. I pray for a new wagon. Here's two dollars for the wagon. I pray for some good victuals. May do. Here's two dollars a piece for good victuals. This is the busiest day before Christmas I ever seen. My pappy prayed for a new plow every since. You run, right, tell your pappy the Lord's got his plow ready for him. My pappy need a new pair of pants. Has he prayed for him? Yes, sir, he done prayed and hollered. Well, you run, tell your pappy to come here. The Lord's waiting to fit the pants on him. My pappy, 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 Tell the people to come a-running. Praise the Lord. I got shoes, you got shoes. I got shoes, you got shoes. Where you get that from? Put on shoes, gonna work our whole guy. Whoa, look. Whoa, look. Everybody look. The Lord sent down more money than you ever seen before. Oh, Mom. What's happening? You got something to do. You got something to do. Grandpa. Grandpa. You know that fine coffin you the one to be buried in? Well, you can have it. What y'all mean? I ain't dead yet. I can see that. But that coffin you the one is waiting for you down at the church. Oh, you was trying to make a fool out of me. I'm going to take my coming to judgment. I'm going to take my coming to judgment. About this, the fire in hell is going to get you for you's day. I want thirty-two dollars. What for? I didn't pray for a kid of carpenter or two. Then you get it. Thank you, Reverend. I want nine dollars and seventy-five cents. What for? I done prayed for a bear of flour. Well, here's ten dollars. Bake yourself some biscuits for Christmas, and don't forget red wagon. I want twenty-five dollars, sir. What for? My coffin, a mahogany one, with wheels on it, so I can roll right through the pearly gates. Hello. Hey. Oh. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I didn't live to see this day. I can give you a powerful good service for five dollars extra when the time comes. Maybe when that time comes, you won't be here. <laughs> <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this year paper has all the figures taken on this year miracle. Sister Esther done worked it out herself. According to the figures, the Lord sent us forty-three thousand dollars. Now that's more money than there is in the whole world. Furthermore, and whereas we have paid out to true believers who prayed for it, the sum of fourteen hundred and fifty-four dollars and fifty cents, leaving a total of forty-one thousand. Five hundred and forty-five dollars and fifty cents belonging to all of us in this year play. Well, that's out the money. It's a mighty amount of money, folks, and it ain't going to waste. I can see the new church right now standing on the hill, shining in the sun. And a hospital. We're going to buy the land. Do you hear the land? And it'll be on. And we're going to buy tools with edges so sharp the earth will jump up to meet them. And we're going to work that ground side by side, raising corn and cotton. And what we get, we shares. There won't be no rich and no more poor. Yes, folks, a new day is done. I want to pay. Stop, stop, y'all. 
We done forgot poor old Christopher. But he ain't the praying kind. How come you knows that? That's something nobody knows but the Lord and poor old Christopher. He's the poorest one of us all. He ain't got nothing, never had nothing. Maybe he prayed for everything. You mean he prayed for all this money? That's something we goes to old Christopher and finds out. If he's done prayed for all this money, he gets all this money. We praises the Lord for what he give us. And we praises the Lord for what he gives poor old Christopher. But, but nothing. Come on, Luke, we're going to find out. Good morning, Brother Christopher. Morning, Brother Luke. Uh, Brother Christopher, has you been praying for something for Christmas? I've got all I need. Well, Brother Christopher, if you ain't prayed for nothing, I guess I can... It done come to me now. I was prayed for something. Is you sure? I sure is. But you said you ain't. That's cause I disrecollect. What you all prayed for? I done prayed for... I said, what you prayed for, Brother Christopher? Well, Brother Luke, to tell the truth... Look! I done prayed for a scarecrow. Say that again. Scarecrow. So that's what they mean when they says the Lord moves in mysterious ways. <laughs> 